Hey guys, Casey Angelosi here, and welcome to episode 130 of At Percussion. This episode is an interview with the one and only So Percussion Quartet. We had them on the JMU campus a few weeks ago, and they gave us a wonderful workshop and concert. I had planned to host this discussion myself, but ended up having a baby that week instead, so good news there. And I was lucky enough to have my student Caleb Pickering stepping in at the last minute, and as you hear, he does a great job hosting this. He recorded this for us on January 19th, 2018, so thanks so much to Caleb for doing that, and thanks so much to the guys in So Percussion for joining us, and thanks to y'all for listening. So, okay, catch you next time. Bye-bye. Uh, so yeah, if we want to go around the room, just so we get, get names and stuff. I'm Jason Truding. I'm Josh Quillen. I'm Eric Chabich. And Adam Slowinski. So we got a list of questions, some of them are from us, some are from Casey, some are from people we pulled. The highest priority question by far. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we do have a uh -oh. <laughs> this, is, this might be from the entire percussion world is, oh lord. Yep. What do we think of uh, this Todd Meehan fellow? Uh-oh. <laughs> I think we've got to let Josh take that. I'm sorry? Who? <laughs> <laughs> Just fill me in a little bit. Who's Todd? I don't know. I, I'm okay. trying to figure it out, too. Um, I think Todd's great. Uh, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> Todd, has a, Todd has a lovely, a lovely online presence called At Liquid Drum. That has um, he just released a, a book method book for tambourine and triangle. That is, um, despite despite his better efforts, uh, is actually a good book <laughs> that every student should check out. Um, but past that, I'll I'll, I'll, uh, I'll let the other guys talk about Todd. <laughs> oh, you won't get drawn in. Nope. Taking the high road, Josh. I appreciate that. Yeah, well, Todd never does, so somebody. I was going to say, let's see if that's visited. <laughs> the high road is less drawn. <laughs> I'm not sure that'll be returned in kind, but that's your call. <laughs> oh, that's good. Yeah. Jason knows Todd really well. Oh. Who? <laughs> <laughs> no, Todd. Yeah, Todd, you guys probably know. Todd mm. helped start the group. Todd um, was one of the first four. We were at Yale together. and um, he's uh, He was always the best one in the group. He's really good at what he does. And... Yeah, well, actually, Eric now is the best one in the group. And Eric, <laughs> Eric plays Todd's parts usually, like in in uh, the David Lang piece that we play, so called Laws of Nature. I used to stand next to Todd and and try to keep up with him, and now I stand next to Eric and try to keep up with him. So it's similar jams. I will say this: what I love about Todd is that he's, I agree, he's very good, but he also doesn't take himself or art craft too seriously, <laughs> which I think is really important, just in general, but I think especially in today's just where there's so much going on and there's you know everybody's <clears throat> trying to stake out their territory or whatever like and the percussion world is so small actually relative to a lot of other just things and on the internet and I, I just love that Todd he does make a serious method book he does he is very good at what he does he's a very good teacher a very good player um, a really good friend a really good fun guy to play with and so <clears throat> but he also has no problem sort of just making fun of himself and making fun of the idea that we would spend all day doing ding ding ding. You well, know, he like, made a triangle tambourine method. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I do. He's he's like passionate about it, but he also doesn't take himself too seriously, which I think actually feeds back on itself in a positive way. I think there's a way to take what you do incredibly seriously and not too seriously at the same time that helps you avoid something that a lot of people fall into, which is a kind of um, kind of zeal, a kind of like I'm so into this one either way of playing or ideology about music that I kind of can't see anything else. You know, you take yourself so seriously that, you know, you kind of can't let things come at you sideways then. You know, it's harder to have a sense of wit or humor or or the idea that things could vary and things could be messy. And, you know, you meet people like this who it's like a kind of, a kind of gospel, the way that they look at what they do. And it's like, well, it's good that you're passionate, right? Like, it's great to be passionate, but my personal feeling, and I think we all share this, is if, if that's so strong, and so singular, you might be missing other things along the way that could come at you from other perspectives. And I think um, I think that's part of what I like about how 
you'll see in Todd's posts such kind of dual personality. What, what we're saying, these amazing, funny videos, which all of us can see ourselves lampooned at some point in, in one of them. Um, and then this incredible passion for something like the triangle, you know, which is really cool, right? And that's actually sincere. You can tell that that's sincere. He's not, it's not, um, what's the word? He's not cynical, right? The humor is not, he's not pushing it to the point where he doesn't think that any of this matters. And you can tell. And I think that that's what is kind of winning about it. I think that's what a lot of people like about Those it. Those other folks, too, I think like Pius and Casey, I feel like have had a, a similar, in the way that me and Todd sort of go back and forth, I feel like Pius and Casey go back and forth. Okay. And, you know, both Pius and Casey are absolute, absolutely virtuosic at, you know... That's the you, big difference, actually. <laughs> that, is the, that is the very big distinction between me and Todd and Casey and Pius. But it's like, they're both... Uh, you know, Pius does a lot of box stuff, you know, and, and it's like totally fluid and fluent in a way that I've never seen any other member player play that type. Now, that's not... For me personally, I don't, I'm not drawn to the aesthetics maybe of Bach on Marimba. Personally, that's not where my life... You know, I play a lot of steel drums or whatever, but like, there's no nobody can sit and look at Pius play that stuff and be like, holy crap, that is pretty remarkable. Same with Casey, like his chops are just crazy and his his composition is very unique and singular to his specific, the way he plays and it comes out in his music. But I love that the, the two of them give each other smack all the time and it's it's just really, I mean, it, it makes social media fun and you also can sort of learn from it too. And, and I don't know, I think it's good. Yeah. Uh, what Alan said about not taking yourself too seriously, uh, I was reading one of your articles talking about Dirk Perkins' term, sometimes music. Yeah. Yeah, and I thought that struck with me, and I shared it with some people, and they agreed. Could you kind of expand on that? Yeah, so as you said, it was uh, it was Doug's concept, and it's it's a way of framing something that um, we've all talked about a lot, which is, so part of when, when I was talking before about ideologies and the idea that this is my music, or, you know, in the last generation of new music, contemporary music, there were these very strong, this sense of camps, and like your friends and enemies were determined by your aesthetics, basically. Um, and to the point where a composer would walk out of the room when another composer walked walked into the room like Zanakis and Reich were on the same panel and like Zanakis like as great as he was like wouldn't be on the same panel as Reich like that kind of stuff I think in our generation we felt like really like <laughs> is the real the tent really not big enough for us to have different perspectives and uh, what I remember in school is some more intense kind of professors giving you a sense that like you were supposed to believe into this music to the point where it was supposed to saturate your entire life and be your identity and the sometimes music concept is like well, couldn't you love this music um, to suit certain times, moments, purposes in your life, but maybe not all times, moments, and purposes in your life? Mm -hmm. And I applied it in the article to um, listening to a Milton Babbitt piece, which he's not a composer that I've been the biggest fan of over time, but I heard a really compelling version of it by some friends of mine who play in Ice and Jack Quartet. And they did it so well that I was like completely enthralled by listening to a composer who, who hadn't usually been my favorite. But this is not a piece that I would sort of have on in the kitchen while I'm cooking or listen to for pleasure when I'm trying to relax or go to sleep or that kind of thing. It was, it was a piece for me to listen to with a specific frame of mind and thinking and listening in a, in a certain way. A lot of what we do in so-called concert music, I think, fits the idea of sometimes music. Mm -hmm. the, the reason to do it is actually to get on stage, to get people in a room, everybody hopefully paying attention, and to do something that feels unusual, special, highly virtuosic, or um, highly thought out. And it's, it's wonderful because of what's happening in that moment in that room. You don't need to convince everybody, this is supposed to be your music for all times and purposes and likes and whatever. This is what we're doing in this room right now, and that's really special so that was kind of the the but that's me just flushing out Doug's concept I want to you know well, again make that clear I feel like a great analogy is is movies for me because I can think about a movie like The Revenant I think is an amazing movie I'm not sure I need to watch it again because it's such an intense experience I don't think Die Hard is as good a movie as The Revenant but I watch Die Hard at least once a year usually a couple times a year just because it's like I can put it on like a pop song or something, mm -hmm. and so. You and know, Die Hard's a really good movie. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> it's your Christmas movie. Well, it's, yeah, <laughs> right, well, totally. Yeah. But um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, I guess what you could say is all music is sometimes music. It's just that everything's on a spectrum. Some pieces you hear once and you're like, I think that was a really amazing thing. I'm not sure I need to go out and hear it again right away. Whereas other things, 
you know, pop music getting stuck in your head is totally fine. There's some kind of music that's meant to be. Well, I feel like Doug was starting to think about that idea when, you know, when So was first starting, you know, and coming out of the Bang on a Can, like kind of what they were doing in New York and this like uh, kind of, I was going to say overt, but like a, a real kind of uh, fusing of like rock ideas and pop ideas with classical stuff. I think then people started to make music. They were like, oh, wait, if this is like kind of like rock classical music, maybe this is what we're supposed to be doing all the time or, the, or like judging things by like how often you'd want to listen to it or something. And, and Doug being a little bit like, OK, well, wait a minute, like our music has a place that's really important to me and pop music has a place that's really important to me. But they're, they're two different things. And let's not. Um, whatever that kind of like uh, indie classical phenomenon of like you know let's try to blend these things. It's like yeah let, let's take let's take ideas from all over the place, but also let's let's yeah concert music can be a different thing than what I put on in the if you're ever listening to to so percussion while you're cooking dinner, you know that could be good. I don't know. I think I made the noise. <laughs> I think I made the noise works for that. Okay, and I okay. think some people have said that. <laughs> but you know, the, the, perhaps the yeah. first movement of Soul Called Laws <laughs> right, is not yeah. the best looking experience <laughs> because it's a very intense and grating and right. sort of you know. Yeah, it's a different purpose. And we haven't said it yet, but uh, Doug Perkins was also a founding member of Soap Percussion. Mm -hmm. So the original four members were Jason, Todd, Meehan, Doug Perkins, and Tim Feeney. Doug wasn't as good as Todd if we were like just ranking him. I, I think it's fascinating that Jason is getting into the hierarchy thing here. He's usually really against that. This is provocative. I think Doug and Todd as a duo. It's perfect. I think they're, they're each of their strengths. <laughs> each of their strengths offset the other's weaknesses in a really beautiful symbiotic way. I think. But yeah. also, I would say, um, like, for, first movement of so-called laws is a really great example to me because when we put on albums, we're used to the idea of. You put on something, you listen to a couple of tracks, and you decide if you like the sound of it or not. And First Movement of So-Called Laws is very, very difficult to listen to. Even as somebody, I, I love the piece, but I, I feel like part of the experience of the whole piece of So-Called Laws of Nature is that that first movement is so challenging, and that sets up what happens in the second and third movements and makes the payoff by the end of the piece so much more intense for the listener. But you have to give the piece the whole 30 minutes or else you don't get that experience. You could put on, you could be like, I'm gonna listen to 10 minutes of this piece and you listen to just the first movement and then you're like, I'm not really into this and you turn it off and you just completely missed the experience. Mm -hmm. So um, I think the sometimes music thing is also partially about trusting a composer to shape a whole experience for you. And you gotta kind of go along for the ride for that. Yeah, so Jason mentioned the different genres thing, and uh, there's all the, I mean, there's other percussion groups that are, you know, on the international, national spectrum. I feel like y'all are one of the few that, this is one of my favorite quotes from the Boston Globe about uh, the concert had both blue hairs, elderly matrons, and, uh, what is it, Artie Punk Artie there? Artie Punk, yeah. It's <laughs> um, a good one. Yeah, so I think it's really cool that I saw a video, I guess it was, was it the first half you did, like, improvised <coughs> Uh, early music or Bach, and then you did the man-made concerto. Yeah, right so we played at the um, on the mostly Mozart festival That's last year, and it was with a conductor Louis Longray, who we had done David Lang's man-made with before, and he wanted to blow out our involvement in that concerto into a whole program, and he had the I believe it must have been his idea to take these Luli um, dances pieces from the Bourgeois Gentilhomme, and um, sort of get back to the idea of percussionists as mostly improvising accompaniment, which at that time in the 17th century is mostly what percussion did. And the idea was not that we would be experts on how that was done, but that we would kind of just try to make our way in and feel it and use some of the instruments that, you know, worked from that time. And it was a blast and and people really dug it. It was really, I would say too, I think, you know, we're, we work a lot with Dan Truman um, and Dan was sort of the first composer. I know if I'll speak for myself, but I think in terms of so that we when we worked with him he would he gave us a, a piece of music where what you saw on the page wasn't exactly how it was played mm -hmm. like there was a way to play what you saw on the page based on you know old performance practices from Norwegian fiddle music and the Luli stuff like watching seeing the page and how stuff was written was like man this has been happening for a long time you know and because what you're seeing is just like you know, uh, straight eighth notes or something, but the way that that music was phrased and the lilt that comes with it and the, the way certain phrases would hitch at the end and then land, like, all comes from different dance forms and whatever, but it was really fascinating to sort of be immersed in that same feeling of, like, man, we're playing this like a lead sheet, sort of, in a way, and our percussion parts were um, not written out. We were playing what we were seeing 
basically reading a lead sheet and sort of improvising within the style of this this piece of music. So um, it was really fun for us, and oddly, we had it was a really easy connection to make um, for us. But so it was you got to really play the the jingle. Jingle, oh, and Johnny? jingle and Johnny, yeah, Jingle yeah. and Johnny, yeah. Turkish yeah. the Turkish Crescent. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that was. Yeah. That's like a, so. Luli back in the day, like you know, the story is that he he stabbed his foot and died of what was a gangrene or something. Like, <laughs> like and they would use these big this big stick with. Uh, he would use a big stick just to keep time. He just yeah. used a stick. And right. the actual this actual instrument wasn't really yeah, typical of the time. It was used a little bit more later, but I think it portrays. Uh, Turkish music within European music and has become kind of a tradition. And I don't know the exact history, but what I what I what I've heard is that there would be a, like a line of these folk and like you know military like Janissary music where there are all these bells and stuff hanging off of it and like if you everybody stamp that stuff in unison, these it would just create this cacophony of sound that was supposed to sort of terrify the. And apparently you know, they would have um, lines of oboes. Of, yeah. of some specific kind of Turkish oboe, and they would have so many of them that it would make this incredible din, this sound that was also terrifying. Like a hundred oboes just like, rah, 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 and people were just like, oh my god. <laughs> yeah. That kind of tickled me. <laughs> but, I wanted uh, to see like that, the back in those days, like there was a little tent of a bunch of oboe players shaving reeds. I think it was a slightly different kind of oboe, but a double reed instrument of yeah. some sort. I would, I would just say to the both kinds of blue hairs <clears throat> question, like, um, I we had an interview the other day where the interviewer asked me, what does it mean that you guys are a classical group? And I really didn't know how to answer him because terminology can be so complicated, right? Uh, like the way that Steve Reich and, and Philip Glass didn't like being called minimalists at the time, but we all use the term minimalism now because it kind of gets to something really quickly that we can all agree on what it means. And what do we mean... The word classical music can mean different things to different people, especially folks who've studied it or folks who aren't really familiar with music much at all. And the kind of stuff we do exists in this weird place on the fringe of a fringe of a fringe of a kind of art form. <laughs> um, and so one kind of person might hear this is a classical concert and think, that's cool, I like string quartets and so I'll come. And another person might hear, this is uh, an experimental classical concert, and they think, experimental, well, maybe... No way I'm going to that. That's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, well, right. <laughs> um, and so I, I think that um, different kinds of people are attracted to different aspects of what it is we do. Well, this, this quote came from this, this show we played in Boston. It was, uh, we played uh, Steve Reich's portrait. We did all drumming when we were in Boston. And so it was very much, we, back in the day, there was this great presenter in New York at a place called Miller Theater. And then he did these kind of satellite shows in Boston. And so it was like, if you were, if you were the matronly <coughs> blue hair or whatever, it was like, oh, there's this composer portrait, you know, of a classical musician that's really renowned. Um, and I think the kind of arty punk or whatever was like, you know, Steve Reich's music has made its way and seeped into so much, you know, like folks who were into maybe Aphex Twin or folks who were into, you know, some of the British rock scene or folks who were into, you know, like different types of um, stuff that Reich's music has affected or whatever. And so there were, I think Reich's music is really interesting to look at like that because there's distance from it and it seeped its way into so many kind of great parts of music scene and culture that it has a way of drawing out specifically. I mean, I, I, I like to think that that applies to a lot of what we do, but that specific kind of Boston Globe quote came from that show, and it makes so much sense to me coming out of the Reich thing. But as percussionists, don't we also find ourselves with our hands in lots of different things from an early age? Sometimes people assume that a classical group getting into influences from pop or from other art forms is like crossing over or something like that. And um, you've seen, you know the music you've seen where it's like a classically trained violinist who's never thought about like Afro diaspora music or anything like that in their entire lives, it's crossing over. You're like, okay, that's crossing over, you know? Um, but I think as percussionists, it's like, that would be a wrong assumption because you usually have people who um, grew up playing drum set. You have within our group, Jason has played a ton of drum set, which means he's played jazz and Afro diaspora music. Josh. Uh, plays steel drums and is part of that tradition, which is an Afro diaspora tradition. There's all kinds of things that we might have our hands in. We come together and we call ourselves a classical group, right? And then you have that issue kind of hanging over you a little bit because when people say, oh, but you're incorporating these other things in your music. And we're like, well, we've all been dealing with lots of different kinds of music for a long time because as a percussionist, you're expected to do that. Even if you start specializing in Baroque timpani, that doesn't happen until you're like a grad student or something. You've been doing all kinds of stuff before that. And I think that's something we've been trying to portray to people about the percussion world and the percussion community. 
Adam has a question relating to the national. Yeah, relating to, cool. to what we were just talking about, yeah. um, crossing over into different genres and everything. And you mentioned pop music, and I just wanted to, to talk to you guys a little bit about your collaboration with the Nationals' latest album, Sleep Well Beast. Um, I guess primarily to Jason and Eric, simply because you have album credit, but also uh, to Adam and Josh, because I'm sure you you had some. How you much had album credit do we have? <laughs> I'm just Special thanks. Your names do appear. Your names do appear. But if you if you just want to talk about that collaboration, how that worked, um, what it was like working with other artists like James McAllister and Justin Vernon, who were on the album, um, how that collaboration started, and what your experience was. You, I think. Um, so our, our in, I guess, besides just being fans, was um, our first in is just being friends with Bryce Desner, mm -hmm. and, and um, we went to the same college and um, studied music at the same time. When yeah. So was first starting, Bryce was there, and um, I remember he would he played in a band called The Clogs that we all knew a lot a lot better, and he was pretty quiet about the national. He'd be like, "Yeah, I'm going to to New York this you know every Friday, you know, or whatever. I'm playing with my rock band in New York. You know, it's kind of like it wasn't a thing yet." Um, but he he was around when we first premiered the so-called Balls of Nature, um, and and we did a kind of like preview in New Haven, and and he heard it and um, like at a student center. Yeah, it was at, at the, yeah. Yale. It was yeah. a student center. Yeah, like <laughs> and Bryce was still a grad student. Yeah, and he was like. That was cool. <laughs> yeah, and I think you know from what from one side of what he does was really like kind of like inspired and influenced by hearing that the first time, which is really cool. Yeah. And so later we had asked him to write us a piece, um, and and kind of realized that he had this kind of. Um, we actually paired it with a David Lang piece on a show, um, so he was thinking a lot about the so-called laws of nature when he wrote um, this piece called "Music for Wooden Strings." And so, you know, that collaboration with him making that piece and um, you know working on it and um, getting these new instruments from um, Aaron Sanchez built these instruments. You know, it's just a really cool kind of working relationship. And so, um, we opened for them once when they did a series of shows in New York. Um, at the, the Beacon Theater, we played on a couple festivals. So, you know, n not that we were super, you know, deep in their scene, but, you know, we'll kind of like, you know, be around a similar scene for a while. Right. And so um, when they were working on their new album, I think they were, um, you know, over over a long time, you know, over the years that they were working on the album, yeah. it like, like slowly came into focus what they were thinking about. And I think they had the idea like, oh, we've done a lot of different kind of orchestrating on a lot of different albums. Um, we've used a lot of strings, we've used a lot of winds, we've, you know, done a lot of that kind of stuff. We've never really dug into percussion, like kind of orchestrating what, what could happen. So um, it was more like, it was really neat, actually. They sent us some really, just some roughs, you know, and I've never heard a, a, a band at that level um, kind of deal over the course of years with you know so some of the first rough tracks are just awesome to hear you know yeah. um, but so the, the session was really just a couple days of us bringing basically all of the instruments we had in, <laughs> in Brooklyn <laughs> carting it up to Aaron Desner's pretty great studio up in um, outside of Hudson sure. um, and so it was like I mean we probably played on 12 or 13 tracks out of at that point they had 20 something tracks and they were still figuring out what the album was going to be yeah. um you know and it was everything from um you know playing parts that bryce had written you know eric would find kind of weird ways to orchestrate them on you know find the om glock in or find the desk bells that mm -hmm. fit this these chords or whatever to throwing them on marimba and vibes and all that kind of sure. stuff um and then a lot of improvise you know sitting down a drum set sitting down a percussion setup and throwing down a ton of tracks having no idea what was going to happen with it yeah. um and it's just kind of awesome actually the more i listen to the album the more i hear small like kind of mm -hmm. bits that have been taken um and then we had just one chance to, to play some of that music um live. when they played the whole album we had one chance to play it live with them up in yeah. um up in Hudson, they did a kind of two day, two different shows. Um, and it was pretty cool. Actually, some of the tracks, it's cool. They, they play live with some some tracks and it's pretty cool. They use some of the stuff that we made to kind of play live in their shows still. Nice. So it's, it's kind of a cool way to get in on it. And I don't know, it was awesome though. I think um, there's a no, they didn't use a lot of the tracks on this album. Um, so I kind of hope there'll be more in to the come kind of thing. Ones. Yeah, sure. I don't know, we'll, we'll see. But we, you know, so a lot of the other collaborators, it was it was never that everybody was in the room at the same time. Right. So, you know, we got a chance to meet Justin out at um, the Eau Claire's Festival. Um, and he he did this this remix and sang over some of the music for Wooden String. So we've collaborated with him from afar, but yeah. never had a chance to play that stuff live with him. So sure. we'll see. I mean, the, the whole scene that kind of surrounds the National is pretty exciting to us. You know, playing those, li playing those live shows was, for me, kind of a cool example of what you have to learn from people who are working in different...
sort of musical genres. Um, Brian, the drummer, I'd always, I'd always loved his drumming, and I've always loved the band. If you're somebody who plays a lot of kind of complicated new music-y percussion, you might hear the kind of reliable 16th note bass drumming that he does, which is similar to you 2 and, and some other kinds of um, bands like that, and sort of think, oh, okay, it's pretty straightforward, nothing really special about it. And um, the experience of playing with them, and we were being sort of an augmented sort of drum world, to go on his thing. Every time he started playing, it was so solid. It was buried so deep in the ground that you were just like, whoa, it was so much fun to play with, to actually add your things with it. You were just like, my God, I know where, I really know where the time is gonna be. And I really, and you're like, oh, that's what a great drummer does in a band like this. And you have to have a lot of different experiences to appreciate what are, like, what's the most valuable thing for a musician to bring in this situation? So this is the great Ringo Starr debate, which I'm not sure we have time to have here right now. <laughs> but people either argue that he was kind of a not-so-sophisticated sort of simple drummer, or they argue that you can't, you can't imagine those Beatles songs without him because what he did was was elemental, right? Was just putting things exactly where they needed to be. I, you know, anyway. Well, the thing, I've, the thing I learned, and I think whether we're not, whether we're working with The National or we work with, you know, Sharon Nova or Caroline Shaw or Don Upshaw and Gil Kalish, like all of these people that are kind of rock stars in their respective, like Don Upshaw is a beast, you know, she's amazing at what she does. But the concepts and the things that everybody, whether it be The National or Don Upshaw, are all sort of, it's like, yeah, Play with great time. Be consistent. Be reliable. Be the, be, like, everybody wants to rely on everything you're doing and know that what you're, is going to come out of your hands or your mouth is going to be uh, consistent and and uh, committed to. And it's like when you see Brian, it's like not not everything Brian does, like like Adam said, is just like, you know, Mar Mar you know, uh, Dave Weckl or something, you know. But it's but it's like man, it's. Nothing he does is like Dave Webb. Nothing, <laughs> but, nothing but, it, but it's like Brian is a serious. I mean, but it's but man. it's where it needs to it's be. What, every, it's exactly what those songs need. And right. Don Upshaw does have those moments where she belts out a thing. You're like, oh my god, that's a human voice that that just did that. But 99 percent of the time, she is just like really consistently with a beautiful sound and great breath support, just doing this thing. And it's like when we're coaching students on playing velocities or something. It's like just let's step back and just talk about time. Like yes, there's a ton of notes. And it's all the same. I mean, and when you hear them talk, you know, Brian's a nerd, man. He loves talking about, man, what are you guys doing on this thing? I, I, to do this thing, I take <coughs> ping pong balls with these shakers inside of it because nobody could make this stick. Well, he so does a clapping thing. music warm up on a snare drum pad, like before every yeah. concert. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Like the he most. has the permutations worked out between his hands, and you're like, you're like backstage, and you're like, oh, we're like these new music people, and he's this rock and roll guy, and he's like, and we're sitting around just like this, just talking about politics or whatever, and he's got his headphones on, and he's playing clapping music on his pad. He's like, bop, 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 he's, bop, got, bop, uh, <laughs> he's got stick control in his... And stick control, I love and it's so like... Much, you know? yeah. Super. But the, the thing is, I mean, the way... Whenever I play in a band, I've never been somebody to write out my parts. I've never orchestrated like that. I've been... I think I, I come... I play a lot of... used to play a lot of jazz and improv, so I, I never am a kind of compose out my parts. Like, Brian kind of composes all his parts out in a way that um, you hear really long phrases, um, which I think is just... is pretty awesome and take... and kind of brings something different to that music in that way, which I think is, is, is pretty amazing. To me, the other thing about those sessions was so much about sound, because whenever I would sit down at the drum set and play something, Aaron was the mostly producing in the room, and it would be like, man, what you're playing is really great. Like, can you take out that high, chirpy sound? Like, it was dark. He wanted everything really, really dark. And when you listen to those albums, the, the kind of drum stuff is really dark. Um, and coming from either more of a contemporary music thing with what we do that does have a lot of highs, or a kind of drum set tradition that's more like Joey Bear and Jim Black, like, um, you know, high, you know, like those kind of sounds or whatever. Yeah, electronic. Well, but sounds. on that band, they allow um, the electronic sounds to be the to chirpy be that, sounds. Totally. Yeah. And there's a real stratification between. <coughs> They're very aware of where the electronic yeah. sounds are sitting and where the acoustic yeah. sounds are sitting. It's possible they were trying to pull you out totally. of that, well, of that and his, layer. I mean, uh, <laughs> Brian's drum sound is so amazing, and it's a very dark, um, and and I love it. It's the way I love Tom's to sound, you know. But like, he uses these like sixteen-inch hi hats, you know, that are the, the darkest, biggest things I've ever <laughs> seen, you know. Um, anyway, kind of thinking about that level of sound detail in the studio, and it's something we think about, but it was just a, a different level. Well, you know? I would say. It's that it's really interesting to watch 
people spend so long with material and tweak it and polish it and like they're they're willing when we were there like jason said we were playing over tracks they already had that already sounded cool to me but they wanted to add something and then try subtracting something and then try adding something again and it you know the classical thing or whatever we imagine that, that means the music is more serious or taken like more time to be put together. I don't think that's true. If anything, Josh and I just did this thing where we wrote a really short thing for the National Symphony and it was awesome and they did a great job. But like I went to the rehearsal, they played it down once and then they said, did that sound okay? Cool, because we got to move on. <laughs> and that's like, you don't, you don't dig into something and say, could we tweak this? Could we spend? And in that world of working with the National, they're like, we're going to spend as long as we need to to get this exactly right until we have a kind of epiphany with it every time we listen to it and so if i'm not feeling that way about it quite yet we're going to try something else and we're going to try something else until we get there and i really admire that they like um aaron desner the the other desner brother had uh, built a, a studio at his house in upstate new york and so they felt like we're not limited in the we're not renting this studio we're not limited in any amount of time um, let's just get together and we'll try some new stuff again well they're always walking that fine line of i mean they have millions of fans millions you know and then when they play on colbert like we, we were super lucky to get to sit in and play with them on colbert and it's like they can't just be like okay now we're going to do an album about with cactus sounds you know <laughs> because that wouldn't you know it's like you can't just go that route so they put everything in the mix and they 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 push the boundaries as far as they can because when they get on Colbert, it's like everything's got to be right where they <laughs> want it to be so that their fans are always interested in new stuff, but are still loving the part of the national, which is what got them interested in the first place, which is that it's a rock band right. that has lyrics that are that mean a certain thing and have a certain vibe to them, and it's this dark brooding thing that's eventually going to explode at the end, and it's like, there's a, I don't want to say a formula, but... There's a there's a recipe that has brought a lot of people to the table, and you you don't it would be stupid for them to just come in and be like we're doing it over, you know, it's like, <laughs> you know, they, and they really respect and love their fans. Well, and there have and been interesting moments where people like the Beatles are a great example. The Beatles got so popular that anything they did mm -hmm. would sell a gazillion albums, and so those some of those later albums where you have things like Revolution Number no. Nine, you're like, well. That shouldn't work. Nobody else could release that track and get anybody get that many people to like it. Right. But that, you know, that's where you get into some of the sort of social dynamics of music making and all that kind of stuff. I remember but with the Cactus, we, when we opened for them at the Beacon, we, we played this duo, <laughs> a, ver a duo version of a piece that we made with um, Matt Most, mm -hmm. and it was a Cactus. It was called Needles. Um, and I remember Matt from the stage afterwards was like, and "We'd like to thank So Percussion for opening." They Played a cactus. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's the like, first time what? that's happened. What? Yeah. And by the way, this is a song that because <coughs> we put beats into it, we thought was like our uh, our hit. hit. Yeah. We're like, there's beats in this song. Yeah. This is gonna be like a, like a <laughs> chart like topper. Two notes that hit a subwoofer, and we're like, <laughs> rock music. <laughs> <laughs> Did it? <laughs> Just Check to show box. you how far out we are. Yeah. 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 Next Can, question. Uh, Sorry. Uh, <laughs> no, you're good. Oh, that's great. Thank you so uh, much. Can, uh, uh, talking about. Um, collaborations we've got the 15 years commission stuff going on still right yeah a couple years ago we were um, taking the opportunity to just sort of look back from the so-called laws of nature as the first major commission and what the group has done since then so we used it as the theme for the summer institute that year and stuff um, and I guess like you kind of pick moments to look back and see what you've done over the years. So we, we had this opportunity at Lincoln Center Festival to do three nights of shows and put on all pieces that we had commissioned. Um, that was a really awesome experience and we feel, I don't know, for myself, I wasn't even involved in all of the commissions that were there, but um, just super proud of all this stuff that's coming to the world. And then also it's an opportunity to look at what do we want to do next? You know, what are the things that we haven't gotten to yet or what should be on the horizon? That's cool. I got a question from Pasic that I feel like. Really? Uh, what does so that mean? The, the Pasic question was, or the Pasic concert was great. Yeah. Oh, question about Pasic. Got there it, got it, got was. It. Uh, <laughs> it was from Pasic. I was thinking, like, did you did you crowd? There was a committee like, that, that yeah, came yeah, up with yeah, the question. Yeah. The yeah. Music committee was like, wait a minute. We're like, all right, what's the question we're going to ask? That's good. So the Caroline Shaw piece, the taxidermy. So there's a joke there, I feel like. Is that what it was? 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, yeah. it went over a lots of people's heads. Do, and well, we're totally, all so it, curious. It totally. This it's not even a funny what joke, joke. But no, it's just about the real name of the piece. Oh. And uh, it's funny because. <laughs> is it funny? Like that one. Funny or that one usually <laughs> lands. Inside joke, funny. The, the sort of the sort of. Uh, the deafening silence at that moment <laughs> is that we were not expecting. Usually people chuckle a little that bit. Was blue, that was balloon deflating right there. That was <laughs> like, I thought it was, no, nobody. It's not, there's not this, some major punchline. It's on? just, a, the, the, so the, you kill on stage and sometimes the, the stage title of the you. piece is, is taxidermy, but there's a subtitle of it, which is, so I hear that you're into taxidermy. And that just changes the meaning of the word and the fact that you're using the title because it's like, so I hear you're into taxidermy is really different than like, this piece is called taxidermy. That's literally all it was, but for some reason it just did not land at that moment. All right, tonight we're playing it out. <laughs> so tonight, let's see how it, it goes over. Yeah. Let's it's, see. From let's a crowd see. point of view, you said that and then everyone's like, is that like a dirty joke or like, <laughs> like everybody, everybody's like searching Should for I can play right now? Like, what, do people know what the word taxidermy means? Hopefully. Do they know what it is? Uh, hopefully. That might I don't know. Taxidermy. Well the is... joke is really that there's a line over the O in so I hear you're in the taxidermy. <laughs> <laughs> so is it so, comma. No, I think it's mm. just like all right, never so. mind. I'm going to take that out of the arts tonight. <laughs> we'll, we'll plant laughers in the audience. They yeah, just, yeah. Oh, God, that would be great. Yeah. 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 Oh, goodness. Um, <laughs> one solitary. <laughs> so a couple of your albums, Where We Live, I bought that one, and it's still stuck in my CD player. It's, it's <laughs> stuck. On. It's oh, on, so. I mean, I still listen to that. I listen to the radio, but I'll turn it on. And it's it's yeah. still there. In um, your car, is what you mean? Yeah, this is my car. The implication was that you would like to put another CD in your CD player, <laughs> but that one is stuck. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, that's one of my favorite ones. But that, oh. Imaginary Cities, and your A Gun Show that you did recently. Mm -hmm. Can you just talk about a little bit of this mixed media, mixed performance art, and kind of these these pieces that have deeper meaning rather than just just music for music's sake, but like a gun show. Well, just as far as the that series, the, those three pieces were all pieces that we did at a, a spot in New York called the Brooklyn Academy of Music. And when we first moved to New York, um, we were kind of trying to figure out where we fit in into the music world. And and um, I mean, early on, really, you know, it was like it was it was kind of awesome to be able to tour at colleges and play for percussion studios. But also it was something that felt like, okay, I'm not sure this is our goal to just play percussion music for percussionists. Like that's, that's, that kind of feels like that's not where we want to engage. Um, but not quite sure how do we engage in a bigger way and, and, and in terms of broader audiences. Um, and so the artistic director at, um, at BAM, at the Brooklyn Academy of Music, was a guy named Joe Malillo. And um, we met him pretty early on and just started to have a series of conversations with him just about, he, he books at a, a um, spot that has music and it has dance and it has theater and it um, oftentimes kind of mixes these things. Um, and so just kind of asking like, hey, we're, we're interested in kind of like um, dealing with in a you know, bigger, broader sense, but not quite sure how to do that. What, what we know how to do from college is like play percussion music, like where are we at? Um, and over the course of a couple of years, we kind of started brainstorming with him about doing a, a piece there. So one of the things he really um, does, he doesn't really present just music. If, if he does present music, it has other elements. Um, because most of the things, you know, if there's a dance show there, it has music with it. If it's a um, theater show, you know, there's visual. It's all kind of multimedia. So with music, it's kind of like, what else are you bringing? Um, and so we had this idea, um, I don't know, maybe Adam, were you reading Italo Calvino at the time? And, yes. Um, there's this, this book, Invisible City, Invisible Cities, um, that I was really into in college too, and I think we, we all kind of dug this idea, um, this author. Um, so we, we kind of started to try to take that and turn it into a bigger piece. And so it had, um, my sister did some uh, videos uh, with it. Uh, we worked with the director to kind of help stage it and help put it together. So um, what those three pieces have in common is that they're, those are kind of like um, uh, efforts by us to, to write music ourselves, like collaboratively and to kind of um, present them in bigger ways and some of them I guess the first couple loosely come out of these books where we live loosely comes out of a, another book Adam was reading by Jane Jacobs at the time um, and then the last one a gun show was kind of us pretty directly I guess trying to think like okay we've been making music for music and not thinking about um, bigger ideas of uh, 
politics or justice or just like big more societal kind of ideas um and it was just something we were talking about a lot so um you know yeah sorry yeah, I, yeah, I wanted no, to say one, one, one thing that's um was strange to me sometimes is that sometimes when we would make that work and people had a sense in their mind of what a percussion concert or percussion recital was and they were like wow that was really different felt funny to me because uh like the really the founder of our tradition is john cage mm -hmm. Um, and so this idea that what you do as a percussionist is fundamentally meant to reach out, reach out across the sound spectrum, reach out to different um, kind of genres and disciplines of art making is completely baked into everything that he was all about. So that always felt really natural to us. And moments where we would meet a little bit of resistance of like, wow, this is really different. You're not just doing like a percussion recital. I sort of wanted to be like, do you even know what a percussion recital actually <laughs> is like or where it really comes from? I mean, it was a it was founded as a genre of um, I'm not sure about subversion, but a genre of things being different and of reaching very broadly outside of the idea of a concert or recital into all of these other things. So we looked to Cage and Cunningham um, and uh, Rauschenberg and um, all uh, Fluxus, all of these movements where these collectives of artists kind of throw things against the wall to see what will stick. And, I, I, you know, in a way, it, it almost is starting to look like those three projects that you mentioned are a kind of trilogy for us of experimentation where um, we tried so many different things and a lot of things worked. Some things worked not as well, but, but what came out of it was very new and we learned so much from it. And we make, when we make work now that is just, quotes, air quotes, um, music and isn't about something deeper, it is so influenced by time we spend in room with directors, right? So these two directors, um, Randy, Randy Eckert and Ayn Gordon, both of whom spend time with us thinking about how we look and move on stage. Uh, a great example is when you're getting your four mallets ready to play marimba and you're fidgeting around because you want to get your grip just right and in your mind the performance starts when you hit the first note and that's when you're focused and fixated and, and all the drama is happening but everything before that to you is like just the prep time and a director looks at that and is like what's all that stuff you're doing right before you start playing and you're like well I'm just getting ready and they're like well it's too late to get ready you're on stage and I'm watching you and you're making noise visually right now that I don't understand what it has to do with the drama of what we're doing and I'm like it's unconscious it doesn't have to do with the drama I'm just doing it and he's like well stop it <laughs> you know and working with people who are thinking more visually stop it or amplify it right or amplify it oh Randy's thing was amplified but it's like <coughs> um, people who's who are thinking more about a visual component a dramatic component a narrative component like it what's this what's the story you're telling um, as musicians who think who play a lot of music that is what, what we have sometimes called absolute music or whatever where it's it's mostly just about layers and patterns and counterpoint and melodies and harmonies and things like that um, we tend not to think of narrative or we tend to avoid the idea that we're telling us I'm not telling a story I'm just playing some notes and rhythms and this and that and a director will tend to tell you you're you're always telling a story <laughs> now your story may be I'm not telling a story but that's a story um, and so working with people from from different fields really enhances the way you think about then you go and play a Steve Reich piece and you're like oh my gosh I'm thinking about all these other things now because of working with these well, people. I would say too that those those original projects, we just did a fourth one called From Out of Darker Sea that we toured, we premiered last year, but we toured in um, November in the north uh, north of England. And um, it was about, it was a site-specific work based on the, the former coal mining uh, towns in the northeastern part of England uh, in this area called County Durham. <clears throat> and we were, it was an hour-long project similar to the gun show and those other things, but more about you know former old coal mining industries and stuff and um same thing video there was text and you know, uh, you know both these guys wrote wrote like drummy pieces and i feel like looking back on those original projects from imaginary city all the way through from out of darker sea like they're also outlets for us because a lot of what most of what we do is rap like we you know we're commissioning steve reich or uh, we're premiering a couple pieces at Carnegie Hall in March by Donica Dennehy and Dan Truman. We just did a thing with Caroline Shaw. You know, those are pieces where, not that you don't have input, because you certainly do, but you're really helping bring someone else's vision alive. And within So Percussion, the four of us have interests in addition to that. So, you know, Imaginary City was really the first time for the four of us to get together and write write music, original music collaboratively, you know, and then try to figure out how to put that on stage. And then where we live gave us an opportunity to like, we, 
you know, Jason had done a lot of improvisation, but the four of us hadn't done it a whole lot. You know, it would pop up every now and again. We would be forced to do it. We were like, well, let's let's explore that part of our thing. And then that morphed into more like songs, like a set of songs that we played with some moments of improv buried in. And we don't get to play songs very much from the concert stage. And it was really fun for us to get to dive in and really make a song with this guy, Gray McMurray and Emily Johnson and write the songs with lyrics that felt like, wow, we, that was really fun to do. A gun show was, I think, a chance for us to explore. You know, a lot of Jason's early, like Amid the Noise stuff, had a noise component to it, like a crumpling paper or, you know, jingling chains or whatever. Um, a gun show was, I think, initially really purely noise based from the beginning. Like, there was just a lot, like, white, noisy sounds scraping on a snare drum or these really aggressive snare drum hits, um, long static moments of, of chaos. You know, Eric wrote this piece that is for all these drums and vibraphones. I wouldn't say it's a tune. It's definitely a piece, but I think what you get is this noise that just builds and just never stops, you know. Um, and that project, I would feel, I feel like is really our first exploration of what noise is and what uh, chaos on stage could be. And, you know, and I think for us, it's, it's always a struggle because we don't, we don't spend a lot of time in that world and just in our daily life tonight, we're going to play a show in the noise. We're going to play some Paul Lansky and Reich, and, uh, not Reich, um, Caroline Shaw. We're going to play. <laughs> Sorry, uh, John Cage, whatever. <laughs> but but these original projects, I think, for us are ways for us to tap into the other aspects of our interests that we don't like. I write a lot of text, and I um, in working with this director, Ian Gordon. It's like it's not. It doesn't make sense for me to get up on stage tonight and be like, okay. I wrote a text piece. This is about you know my home growing up, and we're going to play it. And then we're going to play Third Construction in the Malak Quartet. It's like that maybe doesn't fit programmatically, but in an hour-long evening where there's a narrative that we've been working on for three years that really, you know, plugging one or two of those in throughout the piece starts has started to make more sense for us as a group. And it's been really, you know, the best of both worlds is both worlds, and we really want, don't want to be feel trapped in one or the other. And so I feel like these original projects are going to, in some way or another, be a part of our, our output you know, for the foreseeable future. I would just say um, Adam's point about John Cage being the founder of our tradition and that sort of bakes in um, these different art forms or acceptance of these different art forms as being part of what we do. Um, I think that's really true and especially awareness of visual components and all that kind of stuff. I, I think Steve Schick's book is really awesome and his approach to thinking about that stuff that he's commissioned to pieces where he starts with what he's going to look like while he's hitting the instruments with the composer and then builds the sonic material. Um, I think that's part of us developing these pieces. Like, for example, when you put video on stage, it's really easy for the audience to sit and watch a movie and not even be aware of what the performers are doing. So we had tons of conversations about how do we make this a live performance that people are seeing what we're doing and aware of what's happening in the video at the same time. And you're balancing things that way. But we're always balancing stuff as percussionists with where our instruments are on stage and what we have to do to reach for something and how our music stands look. Do we have an enormous piece of cardboard that the people can't see us behind or something? <laughs> and, um, and then on top of that, I think that by setting a theme for a piece like a gun show, we chose to think about guns in the process of making the material. And so it's sort of an experiment in what is it like to choose what you're going to think about while you're making something new. And that's, that's going to come out in different ways. We, the fact that the show is about guns, if we didn't tell it to people, or if we didn't project it in certain different places, there's aspects of that show that people wouldn't know that it's about guns at all. But in the same way that you wouldn't know that Beethoven's Third Symphony is about Napoleon, except for the fact that he is. What? <laughs> say it ain't so, Eric. Say it ain't so. Like it, it, it's well, our way because of, of the fact tongue. that you can listen to the symphony and enjoy it without knowing that it, it doesn't. I mean, this is the this is the age old question about what music can and can't say, and that's something we had to grapple with a lot in these projects. Yeah. So. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Eric. <laughs> I just wanted to see Adam's face when I when I said it. <laughs> Who's Napoleon? I was stunned just for one moment. No, he wasn't. <laughs> for those undergrads, undergrads or graduates that are current students that maybe they want to go out and because you've influenced like Teague and Mobius and Sandbox, 
and there's all these little groups that are starting to sprout out, kind of following your model. Um, what advice could you give younger people that want to go that route? Maybe what were some good successes that you did right away, or maybe some missteps they could avoid? Perhaps they could wait to see if this model works first. <laughs> Before deciding to base their life on, we're only like, this group's only been together for 11 years, so who knows? The answer that we often give to that question, I think sometimes is a little frustrating for people, but I think it's a deeper truth that we really believe in, which is that we're always honored when people admire what we're doing, um, but we, we usually try to ask them the question of, why are we doing it? Um, and the answer I would say is not because it's not a specific thing about what we're doing like we have to be a percussion quartet that's going to be amazing it's that this medium this way of working the kind of music that we're generating this way of working together suited all of us and the, what we wanted to get out of making music so we all we all like to make music with other people whom we like so um, that uh, being in a group satisfies that uh, equation being in a small group is unique because you have a certain amount of control that you don't have in a large ensemble. Um, and when I say control, I mean like also creative capability. You know, your input can be in the mix, your ideas can be in the mix. But everything that I'm talking about right now has to do with kind of higher sets of values about who you think you are as a person and what you want to get out of life. Because, and this happens to people all the time in the, in the sort of orchestral track, if you're too specific about what you think it's supposed to be and you're not asking yourself why you want to do it, the thing may turn out a little different to be a little different than what you were imagining it to be. And if you haven't evaluated why it would be interesting or why you would like to do it, you could find yourself at odds with it, right? So you may, for instance, and of course uh, uh, an orchestral track or career is an absolutely wonderful thing to do, um, but you may have grown up being like, I'm so inspired by the creativity of Beethoven, I want to play in an orchestra. Um, a lot of playing percussion in an orchestra is about doing a very specific job very, 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 very well. But it might not be something like, oh man, how can we approach Beethoven this time? Well, there's a, con there's a different conductor this time. And how he or she, hopefully, approaches Beethoven is really more the concern than how you approach Beethoven. Of course, there's lots of interpretive possibilities within playing a part. But it's a, it's a certain kind of job. And if you've been growing up thinking, you know, there's something about doing this that's great for me. I like uh, sound. Right? So as an orchestral percussionist, if you're like a cymbal specialist, and I know people who are like, I have 30 pairs of cymbals, and each one of them is slightly different. And that, if that's appealing to you, which it is, could be to a lot of people, that's a fascinating job, right? So for me, I'm somebody who thinks, I feel like I'm a pretty, a very big picture person. I like to deal with words and concepts a lot. I like creative input. And I think of myself as being a little bit messy as a musician. Uh, not that I play long, a lot of wrong notes, hopefully, but just my, my musical personality is kind of messy. I think. Um, and so over time, I was realizing like that aspect of my character is probably not going to suit me ideally for like pursuing an orchestral thing, which it seemed to me was working better for people who had a very kind of exacting um, and precise and detail oriented way of going about things. Those were the people that seemed to, in my mind to be succeeding at that. That wasn't about how I felt about the music or whether I thought it'd be fun to play an orchestra. Uh, those things all seemed cool to me, but I was like, that's not going to suit me for these bigger reasons about who I am. And as a young person, forgive me for using that term, part of your journey is figuring out who you are in a really, really big way. So all of that is to say that um, don't just look at the what of what we're doing, look at the why and evaluate whether there might, whether perhaps a percussion quartet is the best, best manifestation of that for you. Mm -hmm. Many times it, that it wouldn't be because you're not, you or your other friends you're working with, you're not exactly us. Um, and so I think when we're always flattered and honored when we see people thinking that what we do is cool and they would like to do it, and that's no, no wanting to discourage that at all. Um, but think really, really hard about your own development and whether that's actually what it is for you because you may find some other opportunity and this is what happened to all of us. This was an opportunity for all of us that we hadn't been imagining at first that like I went to study with Robert Van Sice because I was obsessed with marimba playing. It never occurred to me like to be in a chamber music group or a percussion quartet. As this evolved, I was like, you know what, this suits me really well, actually. First of all, I get super nervous playing solo marimba, so maybe that's not the thing for me to do like the whole rest of my life. I love working with other people. It suits my strengths. I like like and it was like, oh, okay, but that was a journey of discovery that wasn't me just being like, I have to be this person. Mm -hmm. And we in music school, we get so into this, I'm supposed to be this person. Um, and it's not always the healthiest journey it really isn't I feel like there's something to like when we started off I think we looked at what we had in common 
and we also started off doing what you'd imagine in school. Like we we you know played a lot of the music our teacher told us to play, so we tried to play it as good as we could. And and we did more kind of rep based stuff and we tried to do as good as we could. And the, I feel like the more we've been a group, the more we try to look to our individual strengths and say, Oh, what do we bring this unique you know, when Josh joined the group, what what specific thing did oh he plays the steel drums. That's really cool. Let's see where that goes. Oh wow. He has a real cool sense of like he plays this Korg synthesizer that he he has a uh, pretty awesome relationship with it sounds great oh he writes text what how can that change where we're going and then so early on I feel like it, it could be cool to look for common ground but I feel like the goal is to kind of look for what makes you unique and you mentioned Teague I think Teague is an awesome example of that they, they actually came to the first Soci as a quartet they were originally a quartet and you know they they played some David Lang as a as a uh, quartet and they like were, were learning quartet rep and then um, when three of them moved to New York they, I think, slowly over the last however many years, it's been, I don't think of them as like, you know, soci kids who learn to play rep. You know, I think of them as like very unique individuals, you know, that like, um, I mean, Carson and Matt are both awesome drum set players and like drum set and drums has become more of what they do and they've started to write more music and, you know, Amy um, has traveled all over recently doing this kind of, I forget what it's called, what the... Um, What's that collective? It's really cool. It's like there's uh, folks from all different drumming traditions that travel, you know. Um, no, I mean, she's, she's been to like Africa and, and all over the, the South kind of um, uh, touring this awesome. So she's learned a lot about like music from different um, different uh, kind of cultures and, and they've started to, to write a lot themselves and they commission some and when they commission, they kind of commission bigger pieces from other composers. So I feel like what makes them them is very different than what makes us us, you know, but um, I think they've been, that's been, and, and you, I could, any of the other groups that you mentioned, you know, you could kind of look at that too, like where did they start and then how did they develop into who they are? Um, and I remember early on, you know, like seeing these, um, we saw Nexus a couple times um, when we were early on as a group and it'd be really easy to be like, oh man, what Nexus does is so awesome. Let's try to recreate that. But it feels like just the perfectly wrong answer because who would want to come see us play like, you know, A-way drumming stuff and uh, rudimental snare drum stuff and takumitsu and improvising and ragtime, you know, like, I would pay to see Nexus do that any day of the week, but why would you pay to see somebody else do that? You know what I mean? But if you're a student and you learn all of, about all those things, but then as a group decide like, oh, what I can really offer is this new kind of take on it. It seems like that's a, that could be a good kind of blueprint to kind of help find where you're, you're headed. It's funny, I, I forget when it happened. We played a show a while back and and somebody who was definitely not from like a conservatory world or whatever came up to us and said, do you guys mostly like play covers or are you doing like original songs? And <coughs> it's, it's funny because that's a perfectly normal question to ask for like a rock band. And when we're talking about the National, it's like if you're a person who's a fan of the National and you go to the show and you're like, this is amazing. Your first instinct is not usually to say, like, I'm going to learn every single one of their songs and sound exactly like them on stage, and then a ton of people are going to come see me. Yeah. Of course that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> like, people are going to be like, yeah, you're a good cover band of the National. That's totally, <laughs> that's fine. That's a cool thing to do. But um, weirdly, in our world, that is the way people treat it a lot of times. It, there's this uh, saying we use a lot. It's a best show quote. Seek not to emulate the master, seek what the master sought. And I feel like that really, that should be a really guiding thing for everybody. Exactly like what Adam's saying. If you come to a show and you're into something we're doing, think about why you're into what we're doing and what are the core things underneath that, and then how can you take it your own direction. I would just only add to surround yourself, no matter what career you're in, with people who um, you like being around. I mean, I think... The four of us, you know, whether it was whether it be playing percussion quartet or talking about business stuff, like how we're going to organize our, you know, structure our organ, I mean, whatever. Like, I feel like the four of us give each other a lot of space to have good ideas and bad ideas, and not judge any one person, you know, and say like, "Oh, your idea is stupid. We're never going to do that. Shut up. Don't ever suggest that again." Like. Just no matter how easy it is to play with somebody on stage, like if one of us started to 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 adopt that attitude or that mentality towards wh how we play music or how we bounce, how we collaborate with each other, um, I think any one of us would be like, okay, I think I'm done. Like 
I, I think it's actually that simple. We, and I think whether or not you work at Starbucks or, and then play weird music at night, like if you work at a Starbucks where everybody there like really enjoys being around each other, like there's a lot of people who work their entire lives for 40 years who don't ever get that. So don't be ashamed of that. Like go work at Starbucks. If you love, if you wake up every day and you're like, I, I love hanging with these guys at work. It's, I laugh so much. Like, holy crap, that is, you, you found a little nugget. Like put that in your pocket and keep it. And then, you know, when, if and when you grow out of that situation, find the next situation. And then eventually, hopefully that you're just around people you like being around all day. And you're also injecting parts. Like I didn't come into soap percussion and immediately be like, I play steel drums and I write text and I do this thing. So we've got to do it all tomorrow. Like, no. like come in and start injecting them the things about you that you feel like you can offer slowly and then in the moments when the opportunities arise take advantage of them but if at any point it feels like the people you're working with just suck like sayonara like i i think it's life is too short to be around folks that you don't like being around so um I, for me that stuff i think is at the top <coughs> and, I, and for us it, it applies to who we collaborate with too it's like if if caroline shaw was hard to work with we wouldn't work with her like no matter how good she is like mm -hmm. She, but she's the opposite. She's really great at what she does, and she's super fun to be around. She's hysterical. She gives and takes, despite the fact that she has a really strong vision. Like, those are the type of people we want to be. That we want to spend our days away from our families. Like, mm -hmm. we're all away from the people that we love the most in this world, most of the year, and that that's a real sacrifice. I feel like the four of us had just looked each other in the eye and said, "Hey, this is going to be a reality." So, if that's going to be the case. You guys better be super fun to hang out with in a minivan because <laughs> we're going to drive seven hours to get down to JMU. Um, and we're going to work with folks that we want to work with because um, that's that human interaction is super important. And I think it's done us a lot of good up to this point. And I, I imagine we'll keep, you know, that's going to be part of our thing moving forward. So. Cool. Well, yeah, yeah. Good talk. Um, good, good talk. <laughs> good talk. 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 Bring it back to Doug and Todd. You know, Mike and Mike in the morning. You know that ESPN yeah. show. Yeah. Yeah. So now it's not Mike and Mike anymore because Mike Greeny has a TV show. Apparently, for like the last year and a half, they'd get off the air and they couldn't talk to each other. Really? Yeah. Wow. And and I think it had to do with like Greeny was being like trying like they were giving him a TV show or something and he was going to make crazy amounts more and change his agent. There was like some professional shit there. But to think like, I I'll, I listen to that show whenever I drive and they're on air, it's totally just like, like banters. yeah, they joke about each other's families and like being like, they used to be close, I think. Professionally collegial. Yeah. And then they get off <laughs> camera and they won't, or get off the air and they yeah, won't, like it, it, commercial breaks and shit. You know what crazy. I mean? Oh. <sighs> They sound like the car talk guys or something. They sound like they're really genuinely best friends. Yeah. Well, they're like brothers. brothers. They're brothers. So that's a different situation. I've heard about music groups uh, like this too, sure, and I've just been like, geez, man, I can't imagine spending so, so much right. of my life. Anyway. Yeah. Well, thanks. And thanks to Casey for having us down. Yeah, and, sorry he couldn't be here. Um, we understand. Yeah. It I'm was sure nice for Todd to be here and talk, talk <laughs> yeah. about this stuff. Yeah. And, <laughs> <laughs> let's bring it back around. Uh,